you are worthy right now as you are who you are what you bring to the table the skills you have the lessons you've learned is worthy of everything that you want as you are we're live lindsay morano she's in the house how are you doing i'm good how are you living the dream it's Same. it's going to be 85 and sunny in santa monica california so Dang. for anybody that's been all like ah oh, you know chicago so cold you're not a tree get up and move that's right dude. that's right that's right <laughs> we're, we're just laughing because right behind you i see this podcast mike and you say that <laughs> you do a podcast with your husband and I do. when you're in quarantine with your husband and then you got to <laughs> spend another hour with them. What's yeah. that like? Has it been, has it been rewarding oh, or are you ready for this to be over? No, I, I am obsessed with my husband. So I have loved it. It's been awesome. We wouldn't rather spend the time with anybody else. So we're, we're happy. We uh, kind of had this, like in this last year, this marriage renewal uh, period for us, which has been really cool. Um, to experience and to feel and to see. And right now we're at this, we're still in the honeymoon stage. So uh, if I don't have anything to do right now, either we're going to be working out, or we're going to be up in our bedroom, or we're going to be oh, avoiding God. our kids somehow. <laughs> there it is. See, this is a true blueprint to conquering <laughs> Corona. <laughs> That's right. This is how you do it. You got to, you got to make, you got to spark joy somehow. And uh, we have done that. <laughs> well, well, you're a master at sparking joy. I mean, you can just see it. You're so uh, refreshing. You're fun. You're exciting. You're just like a breath of fresh air. And, and that's a very valuable just aspect of a human. Have you kind of always had that kind of that, that optimist, radical optimist mentality? You know, I think I'm starting to realize, no, I haven't. I haven't. Um, what I have always had is... Um, an inability to say no to something I think I might be able to do. And so I, I run as fast as I can into brick walls all the time. And I have since I was a little kid. And I've noticed that's also left me scarred and bruised a lot. Um, when you say yes to a lot of things, you get a lot of comment from the peanut gallery. You get to be seen fail publicly a lot of times. Um, I have tried things I have no business <laughs> trying. <laughs> I have said yes, I think I can do that to stuff that that I am clearly not skilled enough to do. So I, when I was younger, had, I had high self-esteem for no reason. <laughs> so I said yes to a lot of things. Um, and that has led me to a lot of things that I love and enjoy and, and things that I'm good at, but it's also led me to a lot of things that I'm not. <laughs> mm. And, um, and so, no, I haven't always been radically happy and optimistic and fulfilled. Um, because I've been trying the wrong things for a lot of, lot of years. But in the last, I would say the last three to four years, I've been trying all the right things. And so I am radically happy and fulfilled. And I want to impart that on other people. And so I try to show it as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because it shows through your work. It shows through your, your stories are hilarious. So if you're not following <laughs> Lindsay, you got to do it. Like you, you show the behind the scenes of the behind the scenes. I try. I really do try because I want people to know that I'm no different than anybody else. Like I've had, I've had a lot of success in the last five or six years. We've built a lot of really great businesses that have prepared us for times like this because we've walked through times like this when we weren't prepared and we said, we're never doing that again. And it has radically changed our lives. So yeah, I try to show people, Hey, look, it's not perfect but it's possible to be fulfilled through pretty much anything if you set your mind to it. I love that you mentioned that. It's kind of like the whole philosophy of ice skating. Like if you start ice skating the first time, you're going to look like a dog on ice skates. You're just going to be wobbling all over looking like a total idiot. Yes. And unless someone's holding your hand, you're screwed. You're falling right. on your face. That's right. And that's how it is with getting inside of any hobby. Because I think about hobbies and businesses as being synonymous, right? Because mm -hmm. it's like, if you find a, an amazing hobby that you're so passionate about, naturally, you kind of start thinking, yes, business, how can I monetize this? Yes. hundred percent. But a lot of people sometimes are, are shell shacked because they're just not changing up the routine. Yes. And something that you're so interesting is that you're a master at changing up the routine and trying mm -hmm. new stuff and failing fast. Mm -hmm. You know, you built an amazing, amazing businesses, you know, uh, that speaks for itself, but let's kind of back it up a little bit, okay. you know, like post-college or did you go to school or what was I that? I did. Like? I went to, yeah, I went to college. My 
so I'm an oldest child. And so I am the do whatever your mom said to do child. <laughs> I was the rule follower. Like I just was a really good kid through growing up. I would not have done anything to get in trouble because I would have been too afraid of the consequence to get in trouble. Um, so when I, I went to school, cause that's what my mom wanted me to do. I went to Arizona state and, uh, I was going to go into teaching and that wasn't for me. And I was like, really, I didn't really see the point to a degree, to be honest, because I, <laughs> I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. That's just what I was going to do. It's what I was drawn to. It's what my mom did. It's what her mom did. And it's what her mom did. So there was no way that I was going to be the one that didn't like take the opportunity to work for themselves. And so, uh, I went to work for her right out of school. She was a real estate agent. So right out of school, I was like, I don't know what I want to do. I got a business and communications degree because that's what my mom wanted me to do. <laughs> and she wanted me to sell pharmaceuticals. Like she was like, this is the thing, you know, we lived in Arizona and she was like, this is the thing that's going to be, you know, steady money, really good benefits. You can make a lot of money. You can make as much money as you work for. And she knew that I was goal oriented. So she kind of pushed me in that direction. And I was like, you know, I don't want to drive around Arizona's desert hot <laughs> summer selling pharmaceuticals to doctors. I don't want to do that. That sounds horrible actually. <laughs> and so I kind of started, um, I worked for her for a little bit and I learned her business and I understood how to run a business. And from there I started kind of getting into my hobbies, <laughs> like you said, and my hobbies happened to be photography and scrapbooking and, and making creative things with my hands. And I found that I was really good at it. And so I made a career out of scrapbooking for a while. <laughs> Me and the old ladies, <laughs> I was like 25 years old and I just realized like, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. And so I would create scrapbook layouts out of whatever was happening, whatever photos I had taken recently. And then I would publish them in magazines. They would pay me. And then the, the companies that made the product that I used would pay me. And I did that for a while and it was horrible money. It was a terrible business model. Uh, but I felt like, oh, I'm a freelancer. <laughs> I am doing something of my own. It was really my very um, first like steady income job. It just wasn't enough to survive. So you know, you know, let, let me stop you there because I think that right there, I think you just hit on something so big is that <laughs> you felt like a freelancer. Yeah. And I, I felt like the man. <laughs> and I feel like that is something that is very valuable. Like people, it is. people need to start identifying themselves as that freelancer, as yes. an entrepreneur. You make $1 outside of a nine to five. Side hustle. <laughs> Home girl, you, you doing it. <laughs> look right. in the mirror and the mirror's going to look back. Like, there you go. Gosh, you're so right. Yes. And that was so huge for me. Cause I felt for the first time independent. I felt like Oh, this is mine and I own this and I got it for myself. I built this from the ground up for myself. So anyone who calls on me, it's because I did that. And as a 23-year-old, 24-year-old, I was like, oh, this is what this feels like? I'll have some more of this, please. So that really kind of set me on this path. I ended up leaving my mom and I was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do scrapbooking. And then I realized, you know, you got to pay bills still. So <laughs> my mom was eventually like, Hey, uh, did you want to ever use that degree that you got? Or did you want to just sit around and make minimum wage as a 25, 26 year old? And so I had seen like, so at the time I was at this long-term boyfriend, we'd lived together. We'd been together for 10 years at that time. We'd been together since high school oh, damn. and <clears throat> I could see the end of the road was coming. Our 10 year anniversary was coming. And that was when that was the last day for me, <laughs> 10 year anniversary was the last day for me. And so I actually moved out on that day. And, uh, I was like, I could see that it was coming and I knew that I knew cause we were co-financing. So I was like, I need to have my own thing so I can take care of myself. So I went and got a job at a fortune 1000 company in Arizona. Um, and I worked my way up in, in that business. So I had my freelance business. I kind of put that on hold so that I could have something more steady, worked this fortune 1000 company. And I found I was really good at sales. Like I moved up really fast in that company. Uh, because my sales skills were on point. So I realized I have a gift of talking to people that I don't know and convincing them to do things that, that they didn't realize that they wanted. <laughs> and the nice thing I was selling, uh, something that I really believed in, which was education. It's something that I felt like um, was important to people, especially moms who stay at home. And I was able to connect with moms that have kids that didn't have an option to finish their education and help them find a way to do that online. And that felt really good. Um, and because I believed in it, I was really good at selling it. So I worked my way up in that company, met my husband, 
like, you know, things start to happen. Life starts to happen at about 26 starts to take off for me. So I meet my husband, we get married within a year of that. And we start right away on the track to have babies. And at the time we had agreed we would have one baby and that baby would be a boy <laughs> because 26 years old, 26 year olds in love think they can, <laughs> I don't know, predict the future. <laughs> That's what we thought is that we would agree on one baby and that baby would be a boy and it would be amazing and perfect. And then uh, we got pregnant with identical twins and they were both girls. So <laughs> that was a really big, big transition for us from nothing to twins, uh, high risk twins that were both girls. I just told this story in my podcast. If you want something a little bit more in, de in deep detail, you can get it over there. But one thing leads to another. We go through a series of uh, time in our life for about three years where we had no money. <laughs> we were flat broke. In fact, we brought one of our twins home from the NICU and we overdrew our, our bank account on a $1 red box movie, which was Tropic Thunder and fully worth it. But <laughs> it was a real low in our relationship, in our um, you know, like time as parents, especially to feel like you're starting your parenthood journey as a failure was a, was a rough transition to like, kind of look at yourself in the mirror and go, what are you doing? You are no longer a child. You have children of your own, get your life all the way together. <laughs> and so we kind of did that. And both of us had some trauma from that. Uh, but that day was the day we decided we'd never be broke again. Uh, we ended up moving. So this is the, the time where we start to move for Michael's career. So Michael was in education as well. I had kind of stepped back to be the stay at home mom and Michael's career was driving the train. And we decided we'll move as long as we need to in order for this train to get us to where we can until the kids are in school and we can't move anymore. And so we did that. We moved every year for eight years of our first eight years of our marriage um, from state to state, city to city, new people, new places. And I started a new photography business in every one of those cities. So every time we would move, I would up and move my photography business, which I was doing on the side as just kind of a way to make extra income. Uh, and I was working full time still for that Fortune 1000 company. I was working from home, but on the side, I was doing photography. And I would restart that photography company. And the nice thing was that it was like really teaching me how to start a new company that was based on my work over and over and over again until I was really good at it. <laughs> and then by the time the, the big opportunity landed in my lap, I knew how to get a business off the ground because I had done it so many times. So fast forward, we're living in Seattle now. It's 2013 and an MLM falls in my lap. And at first, we kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday, the other day, but at first I was really, um, I felt uh, taken advantage of. I think there's a natural um, connection to, from, to normal human beings and MLM business that there's this creepy vibe and layer to it. So when I found out that the company that I was using for this essential oil product was an MLM company, I was ticked off. <laughs> I was really upset because I felt like, well, she didn't tell me, first of all, she got me to buy this product and like it. And now she's like, I want to talk to you about a business. And I was like, never, ever bring this up again, <laughs> straight up. So for two months, I was selling this product accidentally, just talking about why I loved it. And I started bringing in a paycheck accidentally as well, <laughs> because every time you refer to someone in an MLM, it's basically like having an affiliate link and they buy it and you get money for it. Right. So I didn't know how all of that worked. I just knew that in order for them to buy it, they needed a link and I had a link. So I gave them a link and my first paycheck was like 350 bucks. And at that time we were on Dave Ramsey, Ramsey's envelope system. So <laughs> the budget was tight and that 350 bucks came in and it was a car payment. It, I would, I was like, oh, I wanted to tell my husband, just put this with the rest. <laughs> like, here you go. <laughs> Don't say I never gave you anything. So that first 350 comes in and that's awesome. I'm feeling super good about it. Look what we got. Surprise. The next one, the next month was 750. And I was like, oh, mama got some new shoes. <laughs> I was like ready to go out and blow the budget. And uh, about midway through that next month, it was March the 25th. I'll never forget the day because it was such a significant day in my life. But March the 25th, in the middle of the night, I was awoken. I call this a God thing in my life. This is one of those things where you feel like uh, God reaches out and touches you. <laughs> this is that moment in my life. So um, I was asleep and I 
was awoken and I was wide awake at about two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And I felt this compulsion to get up out of my bed and go to my computer. Meanwhile, my computer is in my master bedroom. My husband is asleep next to me. He's working full time. He has his dream job. He's working extremely hard doing a department of education audit at that time. And I got up out of bed and I started pounding on my computer. I just had all this information in here and it just was like all <laughs> it had to come out. So I started pounding away and I can remember my husband waking up in the middle of the night and being like, what, what are you doing? You know? And I said, I, I just, I have this idea for this, this essential oil product to create a team that's different, that isn't like the rest of the teams that doesn't do the typical MLM thing that wouldn't take advantage of their friends that aren't looking to build a business in a scum way that actually want a viable second income, a side hustle that can make them some money so that they can enjoy their family while their family is young. And, um, the reason that was so important to me at that time was that a couple of years previous, my mom had died really suddenly. Uh, she had a massive heart attack that was stress induced from her thirties. And I just saw myself walking down the same path <laughs> as her. My mom died at, at 53, uh, looking great, but she was in debt. She never got to do all the things that she wanted and watching, looking at her, <laughs> at her funeral, watching the pictures go by at her funeral and realizing there's a lot of pictures of us. There's a lot of pictures of her kids and the stuff she did at home, but there's no pictures of the things that she wanted to do with her life and the things she wanted to experience. And I don't want my kids to feel about me one day, the way I'm feeling about my mom right now, which is that she never got to live her life. That's not going to be me. I'm going to live this life now. And that takes actual dollars. I'm going to find them. And so this night I woke up and I knew without a doubt, 100% that if I did this, I could change our family finances. I could change our legacy. I could change the way that we build a life. And so um, I decided to go all in on this MLM project and change the way that people saw this business, uh, try attempt to change the way that people build an MLM business. And so um, that's kind of, where things kind of started taking off for me. <laughs> it's so, first of all, thank you for going in so much detail right there. <laughs> like, and, like for you to be able to spin and, and show your like true emotion right there, that was just, be that was oh, masterful. Thanks. It was thanks. masterful. Thank you for just sharing your heart. You're but welcome. it's cool because you built up the foundation of, of you're a wordsmith. It's like a blacksmith, but a wordsmith. <laughs> and that you can really paint the picture of where you're at. And I think yeah. that a lot of people right now are in a similar position but if you don't have that traumatic of a foundation to yeah. start your business, you won't move forward. Yes. You, know, you won't take <laughs> it seriously. And it's like so many people are going through that shit storm. Yes. And they're just like, they don't know what to do. Yes. And, and instead of letting it kill them, you know, you found a way to use it as a driver. Yeah. And that driver and that foundation just like freaking throws you past all the BS that you're going to go through. It so does. moving forward, you start building this business, you build mm -hmm. this foundation mm -hmm. and it just gets massive. It does. So once you build this huge organization, you have this, you know, amazing residual income, you then mm -hmm. go on to build multiple businesses, multiple online yep. businesses. What have you learned about the online world that you can tell us? Um, I have learned, I think the biggest lesson that I learned is that uh, you can show up as you are, that you are worthy right now, as you are, who you are, what you bring to the table, the skills you have, the lessons you've learned is worthy of everything that you want as you are. So many times I find, especially women watch and see what other people are doing and they base what they can or want do want to do or what they choose to do based off of what other people are doing. Uh, because they think that's the way it has to be because I'm not worthy as I am. I need to be a version of Lindsay. I need to be a version of Ian. I need to be a version of whoever the cool person or the person that they look up to or the person that has done the thing that they want to do. I need to be a version of them. I'm not enough as I am. And that is bullshit. That is bullshit. Everything that you need is in you right now. Now you may have lessons to learn. You may have things, skills that you need to acquire. Those things will come to you. All you need to do is chase the feeling, chase the feeling. What is it? So can you close your eyes? 
And you think about like, think about this last month and a half sitting in quarantine. How did that feel to you? What feelings came up that you ran from? What feelings came up that made you feel like you need to escape from them? What did you made you feel like I need a drink right now? <laughs> I need a, I need a joint right now. What is it that made you feel like, Hey, I need to escape this. This feeling is not good. I never want to feel this again. Whatever that is, you run as fast as you can to avoid that in the future. And that will bring to you the thing that you're supposed to do. So for me, we went through this in 2008 when we had this major recession, Michael and I were broke as a joke. We lost a house. We couldn't feed our kids. It was a mess. And at that moment we said, we will never experience this again. And the next recession, we will be prepared. And here we are in this last six weeks, Michael and I's life has not been interrupted at all, at all. In fact, we've made more money. I made more money in the last couple of months than I've made in the, in the previous I would say eight months before this last couple of months, because we were prepared for this. We had decided we're never going to experience that feeling of hopelessness, of being broke, of feeling like we couldn't do the things that we were called to do. We'll never do that again. And we chased that feeling of preparedness, of safety, of all the things that money will give you because money is not a bad thing. <laughs> money is an amazing thing at a time like this. And you can be prepared and you can find that through doing something that you love as long as you chase the feeling and not the money. Yeah, something that really spins out into my brain while you're saying this is this idea, like you mentioned, running away from those feelings of doubt, guilt, yes. like the things that scare the shit out of us. And yes. we all have some, like there's certain aspects of our lives, whether that's family, health, relationships, business, that scare the shit out of us. Yes. And we're so, so terrified that we just burrow it down and or or we push it onto someone we love mm -hmm. and we make them do the dirty work our kids but it's, <laughs> but it's like if you don't face that fear yourself you're never going to feel like you're in control and that's yeah. the hardest thing like even if you're you're like i found just in my personal with health challenges and such like that that when i don't feel like i'm in control when i'm not on a plan when i'm not on like a all right, on Monday, I'm doing this, Tuesday, I'm doing this. And eventually, mm -hmm. hopefully one day it's going to get better. Mm -hmm. Then your brain just creates like an a crippling anxiety that just yes. brings you down mm -hmm. and you can wear a smile, but you're freaking crying inside Yeah. until you can kind of just look in the mirror and just like decide that you're no longer going to be a victim, that you're yeah. no longer going to feel like you're out of control. You're just always going to get run over by the train of guilt in life. So I feel that so hard about yeah. the fact that you got in control and now, you know, you're in this recession, but you got the house, you got the man, you got the kids, you got the yep. mic, you're, you know, you're yeah, doing man. your thing. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. It feels really good. Really good. And there's a lot of different angles to kind of look at this whole online world and building an online business. So it's like, what do you think are some of the key factors that differentiate the super successful brands that you've encountered because inside of your podcast, I mean, you've interviewed incredible humans and you've been surrounded with complete badasses. What are a couple of things that have really stood out to you amongst, you know, people that have gotten to those levels? Yeah. So I think the number one thing, uh, the one thing that I can tell you right now that would increase the, your ability to close sales, to be able to connect with people by 27%, 20 people that have this one thing, increase their sales and closing by 27%. And that is the actual benchmark for how are you doing? How are you connecting with people? Are you making the sale? Are they saying, yes, you have something that people actually want. And that is so easy, something you have control of, and it's your confidence. You walking into this with confidence, you talking to people with confidence makes 27% difference in your interaction with them in the final sale. And so I think the, the number one thing I see across the board from people, the people that are really, ex that are excited, their hair's on fire for what they do. It's taking off without them. It feels like they have that Midas touch. A lot of people call me Midas, right? Because the things that I touch turn to gold. But the <laughs> truth is, I just believe I can do it. I just believe there's nothing that I can't do. If you told me and my team, I need you to do something that's way off the wall, there is no doubt that my team would say, well, at least we could try. We will try. We'll say yes and we'll learn along the way. We may fail seven times getting there, but we will try. I will try anything and I, can, I do believe I can do anything that I'm called to do. If the, if the opportunity is put in front of me, that's a door I, have a choose, I can choose to walk through. And there's no door that I feel like I, 
that's the one thing I can't do. I can do it. You bring it to me, I can figure it out. I mean, I have the experience, but I'll try it. And that confidence is everything. People want to be a part of that. People want to be a part of that because they think there's enough negative. There's enough people that can't do it. There's enough. I'm so sad. My life is sad. I don't have anyone with me. I'm not I'm missing this connection. We're more depressed than we've ever been. There's enough of that. One person comes in and radically is excited and radically feels like they can do anything. That's the thing people want to jump on. You want to grow your MLM? You better be the most excited person in the world. You want to grow your brick and mortar business? You better be out there in the craziest costume you've ever seen being excited for your business. Nobody will be more excited than you are. And that's the thing I see across the board is these people that are highly successful and work at this high level, they are confident that they can do what they say they do. So true. Be it till you become it. That's right. The Midas touch. Everything you do <laughs> turns to gold. That's great. That's what we're probably going to call this podcast. How I to turn it. your business with the Midas touch. Here it is. That's but that confidence is. comes from those, those, those wins every day. It doesn't just, you don't just wake up. You're like, I'm confident. No, mm -hmm. like you have a few situations where the odds were against you. Yes. Yeah. And you spun around and somehow yo ass made it to the top. <laughs> That's right. And then you look at yourself and then sometimes people get imposter syndrome. Yes, I agree. Right. Like they make it and then, uh, and that happens a lot in, in the MLM industry for sure, because things can take off so quick mm -hmm. that like, you know, you'll hit such a big rank and you're making so much money that you'll almost be like, do I deserve this? Yeah. Oh, for sure. And uh, money it, will reveal problems. A hundred percent. So interesting. And then yeah. it's like, I, lo I love, I, I say this all the time. So sorry to our podcast listeners, but it's like uh, the, the quote from Naval. Uh, he's the founder of AngelList. And he basically says that you have to get wealthy, like you have to get wealthy in order for you to finally figure out that wealth isn't the answer. <laughs> That's so true. But you'll never be able to convince a broke person that, you know what I'm saying? Oh, it's so true. Like, and I had to become wealthy in order to know that money was emotionally neutral. <laughs> I had put so much emotion on my money that uh, by the time that I finally had it and I, and I realized, oh no, this is the most neutral thing in my whole entire life. And I have put all of this, it's good, it's bad, it's yes, it's no, it's it, you fill in the blank on money. And I would never have known that until I had it. You, it's just one of the things that you have to experience, which is why I think every, everyone should experience being a millionaire. Everyone can experience that. Everyone should experience that. Uh, everyone should set their goals on, on wealth because it reveals so much of yourself to you. I feel like I can do so much more deep soul searching because that root, uh, the thing that that's like that buzz in everyone's head, that high level buzz that's always there is, can you afford this? Is the money going to work out? And that stress is just constant when you don't have it. When that bar lowers and you no longer have that worry, that buzz is gone, it frees you up to think in completely different ways and about diff things differently because you don't connect money to it. Can I afford that? You already know the answer is yes, I can. Is it going to be rewarding is the question that you have the privilege to ask now. And is it going to bring me fulfillment? Is it deeply fulfilling work for me? And if it's not, I now have the privilege to say no where I did not before. And that brings so much joy, so much joy uh, and, and excitement. And like just a, that, that feeling goes away where at night, the day before you think, oh, I gotta, I have to work tomorrow. And that, it's the restaurant thing. Like you go to a restaurant and you're like, yo, I want this steak with this steak, 30, <laughs> 35 bones. I'm like... <laughs> The way yes. I, you know? I want it. Yes. Bring it to me the way I want it. And I, you know, it just like, it allows you, it, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to think like this about your life and to be able to think deeper about what you want. Um, and having money off the table does that for you. Do you think that inside of our society of, of basically always pursuing getting to that next level, do you think that when it comes to running the wrong race, do you think that a lot of people are just kind of trapped in the wrong lane today? Like maybe they're just haven't discovered that there are other options. Cause I feel like so much of my, like when I, there are so many super, super, super talented people today mm -hmm. that are so underpaid and undervalued. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And on the flip side, there's also some, 
Yeah. Very silly, you know. Overpaid people. That's true. God. Jabroni's making ridiculous amount of money. I agree. So it's like I've always wondered because you know I I when I was in college I. I was at the right place at the right time in an MLM. I hit like a six figure income. Life was dope. Like I thought it was, everything was sick. Company gets shut down. I lose it all. It's like, yo, huge imposter syndrome. Right. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have the pity party for a day and you rebuild it. And then Mm -hmm. always what happens, it's better than it was before. Of course, Everything is always, (laughs) you know, it's just like, it seems like it's always better than it was. Like when you look back at your past successes and where you're at today, so if you could have went back in time and you could have talked to the Lindsay that was maybe 25 years old and scrapbooking, making mm-hmm. ends meet, three babies, what would you, what were maybe three things that you could have told yourself that could have saved you a ton of time, money, headache, heartache, and it can't be, I wouldn't have told myself anything because it made myself who <laughs> I am today, which is a fantastic answer. Yeah. I mean, that's true. I would, um, I would feel all the feels still. So as long as I could keep that intact, as long as I could keep the lessons that I learned through the really emotionally tough times, because I feel like uh, I asked my husband yesterday, even, do you think like, it's always going to hurt like this every time we have to learn a lesson? Like, it's just always going to feel like this where we have to like be you versus me, uh, for a little bit in order for us to learn a lesson. And he said, yeah, <laughs> I do. And, um, and so as long as I could keep the pain intact because the pain is my lesson, uh, and the anger intact, I would say there's a couple things I would tell myself. Number one is that I'm, you're never stuck. I don't believe in stuck. It's not a thing. Um, stuck is really just fear. And so if I can, if I could tell myself, start identifying the times when you feel stuck and, and asking yourself, what emotion am I running from right now? What is it that I'm, that's keeping me stuck. And what am I benefiting from being here? Number one, I would tell myself that. Number two, I would tell myself to find an NLP therapist ASAP. (laughs) NLP is neuro linguistic processing. Uh, And it's something that I've been learning about and studying about in the last couple of years. And I have a counselor that um, understands and knows NLP. And basically he helps me understand why my mind does what it does and why it's why I can't believe my mind so much of the time. So much of my, the time my, my mind and my brain are trying to protect me from things that are not really threats to me and it keeps me small. And so if I, I, I messed around with a lot of therapists that weren't great for me um, when I was trying to grow and I, I would tell myself to skip right to NLP and find that. <laughs> find someone who understands why I'm making the choices that I make and help me um, change my mindset because that's the real thing. And then third, I would tell myself to start um, thinking of my marriage different earlier. Um, We're 13 years into marriage and we love each other to death and always have, we have a great marriage. Uh, We've had some rough patches for sure, but I would start, I didn't shift my focus on problems in my marriage um, to where it was me and Michael versus the problem rather than me versus Michael (laughs) with a problem. And I wish earlier I had realized that he was on my team uh, because so many times I kept things from him or made decisions to communicate with him in a way, um, not realizing he's, he's on my team. He's on team Lindsay. This is not him versus me. Um, I should be kinder to him. I should, I should give him more grace. I should see him for what I know his heart is rather than um, projecting my shit on him for so many years and I would have had such a happier marriage and, and honest to God, this person is in my, I I work, I work with my husband. We work with each other 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I, I would rather be with no one else. And, and I wasted so many years that we could have been blissfully happy fighting with him over something that we could have been fighting together for. That's powerful. The whole marriage thing is so confusing to me because I'm so (laughs) like, I'm, you know, first of all, I'm 27 and single right so like i'm not like deep in the marriage deal yeah but you see so many growing up you see i see so many of my friends parents getting divorced yeah and you know their divorce rates are so high and it starts to get you thinking you know why do divorces happen and Mm -hmm. why are people jumping into marriages so quickly and why Mm -hmm. is there pressure to jump into marriage yeah Um, it's interesting to me just the whole debate and I don't want to like because sometimes people like get spicy about the whole idea you're good but like like spicy let's do it (laughs) do you do you believe that number one I need to sign a paper to prove that I love you 
Like, do you feel like you need to get the government involved when it comes to marriage? Or do you mm, feel that you can no. have just a strong, strong relationship, never get married and love somebody just as much? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I think that what's right for me is not right for everyone else. So I would say that, that everyone has a different relationship standard for what's going to work for them and make them feel fulfilled. And whatever everybody's answer to that is, the answer, what will make me fulfilled? If your answer is never getting married, um, I would say, great. I would say that probably comes from, there's some deep-seated trauma there probably. There's some stuff there that makes commitment scary. Anywhere that makes you feel like the answer is for sure no for me, I would definitely explore that because if it comes from a place of trauma and there's fear there, then you're holding your back, yourself back from something you could experience that's amazing. And in my marriage, I have experienced an amazing level of commitment that maybe we, we wouldn't have if we weren't married. So marriage is right for me. Having a piece of paper is right for me. Um, I want to know that legally this man is bound to me. <laughs> but that's because it's right for me. It's what I wanted to do. And also, um, I tend to be a little bit more traditional about some things. Um, I like thinking that I am being a part of something that my, my parents were through unsuccessfully that my grandparents went through successfully, that my great grandparents went through unsuccessfully. So um, do we have what it takes? This is hard, it's a hard thing. You're asking a lot from yourself and I think something that maybe um, is against our nature even. Like right. I would say that monogamy is hard, it's a hard choice you make on purpose. And so um, for, us, for us, it's the right thing, but I would never say that that's right for everybody. Uh, whatever you believe is what's right for you. And I am not here to tell anybody what to believe. For sure. I feel you. I mean, <laughs> I definitely one day want to have a humongous family. You I know, I'm definitely, I, I got a lot of love to give. So if oh. I, you know, one day if I had little Jones is running around, like, what's up, <laughs> little Jones? I just, just feel like I'd raise a nice human. You, know? you would. You'd I, would be I think it'd be a dog. fun, I think it'd be a fun experience. With that said, <laughs> like, I think people jumping into it way too quickly and, and not really vetting the human that they're going to be spending yes. the rest of their life with. Oh, we're talking about the person who is going to be in your fight with you. This is the dog that's in every fight with you. If you don't think they're the best human being on the planet and you don't feel like you're marrying up, get out. <laughs> you are marrying down, that means. Like, no, you need to have the person who makes you want to live to, to their standard. And that's who Michael is for me. Michael's a better person than me, straight out. I'll tell you honestly, he is. He has a better heart than me. It's softer, it's kinder. He has walked through his trauma with more grace than I have. I am a better person because he's in my life. And so therefore I want to legally bind him to me. <laughs> I also think that like, if you're going to have children, then marriage makes a lot of sense to me. But if you're Agreed. not going to have children, then I don't, I don't know. Um, I could be with you on that for sure. Uh, look, I think it's different for everybody. I was in a 10 year relationship and we didn't get married. And that ended because he didn't want to make the commitment to be honest at the end when we were 10 years in. And I was like, Hey, are, are is this, are we going to, where are we going from here? So we're 10 years in here, yeah, yeah, 26 that's years deep. old. That's deep. Where are we going from here? And if, if, Hey, yeah, I could get married to you. Wasn't next on the list. Then that told me there's something here. That's not right. Get out. And, and I had love for him. <laughs> I did. And now thank God it ended because I found Michael through that. And, and he is, he is meant for me. The last mm. relationship wasn't right. It had a lot of love. It wasn't right. So I think there's a lot of, in, there's a lot of symbolism with getting into a marriage. Right. And then sticking with it though. Like that, yes. that also takes a lot too. It's just like the business deal, right? Like you yep. get in cause you're excited and you're fired up, which I think is like the number one consistent thing that you need to do when starting a business is you need to be like, okay with not making money for like, yeah, that's years. true. Yes. Cause and you love you, it so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then naturally you end up making money because you're okay with not making money, which is a crazy paradigm. But when you start chasing the dollars too quick, yep. monetizing your brand too quick, yep. you just kind of yep. like throw salt on the wound. You're just like, Oh damn. Like you gotta, yeah. you gotta let it marinate. You gotta work hard at it. You gotta build the foundation, build, you gotta earn your stripes. I always talk about a Kapok tree, K-A-P-O-K. It's, okay. the most, it's the most badass tree in the Amazon rainforest. All right. It's an absolute massive tree. I mean, we're talking huge. And it's like every person's brand is like a seedling of a Kapok tree. And if people start thinking about their, their brand like a Kapok tree, then they'll stop getting upset that in year one, they're not attracting B players and A players and straight eagles into their businesses. <laughs> you know, it's like 
I would not be able to get Lindsay Morano onto my podcast because she's a legend. <laughs> no, if I didn't first put in the work and put in right. the groundwork and, and raise up that social equity and be yeah. able to have enough stripes to be yeah. able to entertain the time that somebody like Lindsay can, can impose. So it's like, to me, yeah. your success is inevitable <laughs> if you put in the work, you earn the stripes, and you prove to the other human that you deserve their time. Do you feel me? Yeah, I so feel you. I agree. I think that, yes, you have to be of value. And in order to be of value, I th again, I think this is the same thing. You just need to run into a brick wall 100 times until you learn whatever the lesson is. This is the thing that people want. Uh, but you got to be willing to run into the wall. And I think so many people are afraid of how bad the wall is going to hurt that they say, I'm not even going to try. That's the real deal. Women, especially, oh, I can't do that. And they make the excuse their children. That's the worst part. Do not make your excuse for living small, your children. We all know that the best way to raise children is to be a good example to them of how to run into a wall. <laughs> your kids need to learn how to fail. In order to do that, they need to see you do that. Moms, you cannot live small and say, I'm doing this for my kids. If there is something hidden in your heart, something that's more for you out there, I expect you to run as fast as you can into that wall and do it publicly in front of your kids because they need to see how that happens. They cannot grow up thinking like the rest of their friends that this perfect lawnmower path is mowed for their success because it's not. It's not. They're going to have to earn it. And in order to do that, they're going to have to run into a bunch of brick walls. Might as well start. <laughs> the lawnmower example just burned deep in me. <laughs> I'm like Oops. visually looking at myself. We had one of the push lawnmowers. Oh yeah. We had like an acre growing up, which was a sizable piece of land. And like yeah. I had a one push Woo! that thing. <laughs> My parents were absolute savages. They would rake leaves and fill up 200 bags of leaves <laughs> while the neighbors were just getting the service that would like, you know, just You'd come and do it for you. <laughs> Rude. Like, nope, nope. My mom's like, I'm raking, I'm raking. I'm like, yo, all right, that's a, that's a problem. I'm not saying that that's admirable. I'm saying, yo, outsource that. Yeah. When there is an easier way to do it, oh, outsource 100%, that. hundred percent, a hundred percent. But it's true. I think, I think of so many women that, that I know and love who are so concerned with mowing their kids a perfect path, not realizing what they really need is for their moms to fail. <laughs> what they really need is for their moms to try. What they really need is for their moms to find something that fulfills them. And if it's not their kids, great, great. Because for so long, I was ashamed to say, I, I don't feel fulfilled by being a mother. I love my kids. I don't fulfill, feel fulfilled being a stay at home mom. There's something else for me. And I hid that for a long time. And I hid what makes me, me. It makes me fulfilled. It's what my purpose is. And if I had continued to do that, I would have looked back at my life when my kids left my house and gone, I just wasted all of my chances because now I'm too old, right? The excuses will come. It doesn't matter. The excuses will come. So might as well start now. <laughs> I agree. And I also, when you do have, when you go through the whole children early deal, you, there is that huge upside that yep. happens in 20 years when they're yep. old enough and yep. you're still young enough and you actually get to like enjoy time with them. That's beautiful. Yes, I agree. I agree. But you got to get past that craziness first. You got to make it through. And you got to build rough. that bond and bonds are everything in life. Relationships are everything in life. The people we meet and how we connect with each other are all important. The friends mm -hmm. we have are so important. I mean, to me, like people is the ultimate reason of, of life. Like, I that's don't it. know, like, I love, love my friends. And that's why mm -hmm. Corona has been freaking everyone out, <laughs> you know, but yep. the whole, but the whole truth is, is that like, do you put value in your friends and help them out and be there and, and do those things? Do you just do the little things, remembering their birthday and mm -hmm. showing that you care about them? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you can have the dopest house, the hottest hot tub, the most epic garden, you know, growing the fattest squash. Yep. But if you don't have good friends to eat that squash with, with it sucks. Like my dad says, you can get like the hundred dollar steak, but honestly, the twelve dollar steak tastes real good with good company <laughs> and a Guinness. You know? So true. It's so true. You know, I have had to learn a lot about balance. So I think, especially entrepreneurs, people that are entrepreneurial, they can get really focused on their one thing. This is what I'm doing. I don't have margin for anything besides my business, my kids, my marriage. I'm supposed to work out. I'm supposed to drink a hundred ounces of water. I'm supposed to be doing a list that's longer than 24 hours. 
And so something's got to give. And I don't believe in balance. I think that it's bullshit. I think it's something that we do to to ourselves to just like hold ourselves down and hold ourselves to an impossible standard so that we can prove to ourselves yet again, I can't do this. (laughs) We're just looking for ways to prove to ourselves we're not enough. And I think balance is one of those ways. And so there are times in your life where you're going to choose. I think there are six cornerstones to your life. And I think relationships is one of those things. And there are times in your life where you're going to choose your business over relationships. There are times in my life where I chose my business over my family, over my friends, over my health, over, over my spirituality. I chose it over everything because it was right in that season. But as soon as it wasn't, I had friends or people in my life that loved me enough to sit me down and say, you're addicted to your work. You have a problem. You need to go get a counselor. And because I had that, I had that fail safe, that backup. I am a healthier person today because two years into my business, that's exactly what happened. And I was completely fulfilled by my business. All six areas of my life that I could feel fulfillment, I got from my job. And therefore I didn't need it from friends. I didn't need it from my family. And my husband was like, no, I love you more than this. So sit down, you're going to listen to me. And then you're going to go get some help because your addiction is, is hurting us and it's hurting your kids. And that's not the mom you want to be. It's not the wife you want to be, and it's not the friend you want to be. So be better. Right. And, and I, I did, I went and and became better. Am I a perfect friend? No, no, I'm not. I, I don't think of relationships the way, the same way that a lot of people do. Um, as far as time put in and being thoughtful and all that kind of stuff, my brain is just like this. Um, but there is a lot of value that I do bring as a friend and I will be the one that's there. If you've got a problem, I will be the one to help you solve that problem. That's where my, that's my zone of genius. That's what I do. Um, and so I have the friends who, who appreciate me for what I bring to the table and don't expect from me, um, what, what they bring to the table. It's amazing. find the people that are going to support you being who you are and who you truly are and not the person, the version of you that they, they think they want from you. So NLP, that's the real deal. It's the real deal. <laughs> it's the real deal. Yeah. Have you ever done it before? No, but I, there's another astounding human, Aaron Birch, who I just admire so much. And she's all about the NLP life and reprogramming your brain, the whole Dr. That's Joe exactly what it deal. Is. It's, and- changed my, it's changed my perspective and view on life in the last, so six months I've been doing it. And I've even been off for the last three months. I've been taking off for the last three months just so I can process how different I think now. It's, it's an unbelievable change in my mindset and, and simply through something simple, like I'll give you an example. So um, I still struggle with grief. So my mom died. It's been nine years now. It'll be 10 years this October. Uh, and I, I struggle with this grief because it was so unexpected uh, when she died. I, I, I had so much um, plan. I had made this plan <laughs> like a human does of this is how my life is going to look. My mom is going to be involved in my daughter's lives. It's going to be amazing. They're going to have this amazing grandparent. My mom's going to get the chance to be the kind of parent that she wanted to be and wasn't able to be. I'm going to be able to give that to her. This is what it's going to be like. And three weeks into my final baby being born, all of that was gone. And I am still grieving. I'm going to get emotional. I am still grieving the moments that aren't happening and... NLP has given me the tools to do this, where I, where I can say to myself, what specifically is it that I'm missing about her? And then it gives me the tools to be able to find that in my life right now. Because the universal law says that, that the amount of love that you feel never drops below 100%. It just shifts from person to person as things change. So when person that gives you love leaves from your life, it's not that you have less love. It's that the people that are left in your life give you more. They still fill up that same cup. And if I can look for that specifically, I can stop the tears in their tracks. I can stop it immediately because I can feel that she's still here with me more than ever. Her influence is here. She's everywhere. All those feelings that I feel like I'm missing from her, I can still feel for her if I look for it. And it's about reprogramming your brain and reprogramming your mind to think differently about the things that you perceive to be negative in your life, because those things are actually all the positive. (laughs) it's amazing you should do it 
who do you like is there every there's different people that are certified and you just got to find a coach type yeah deal? so i just started googling i started googling nlp in my area i went and saw tony robbins speak and he talks on nlp a lot too i started reading books and i started uh just googling what's in my area who knows nlp in my area and you're not going to find it from a traditional therapist it's a different kind of therapy it's not the kind of therapy where you go in and do 10 years of long work to unpack your trauma it's where you lay your trauma out and then they, they say, they open up the book and go, oh, you're looking at this all wrong and it's done within a day, right? And then you go home and you're, and you're like, it just makes you think differently and you process it for months. For months, I've been processing the things I learned in November and December. Amazing. Well, Lindsay, I know, I know I could talk to you forever and I'm so, <laughs> grateful, I'm so grateful for this, for this podcast and just getting this intimate you know, chance of, of learning. And thank you for opening up your oh, heart so and, it. and getting them tears out and just being real <laughs> and genuine and authentic. That's so empowering and cool. And just like very, just you're hey, it's cool I, that you can go there. I love what you're doing. I think it's really cool. I like the format. This is the first format that of a podcast that we've had. We're kind of like just a real conversation that kind of just leads where it leads. And and I like it. I think it's really creative and I'm, I'm, I'm here to promote you. I think you're doing a great job. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And if there's one thing you would say to that person that's right on the cusp of jumping into say entrepreneurship for the first time and stepping into that power and they're right on the edge, what would you say to them? I would say take one, one right step at a time. Uh, it doesn't have to be this thing where, where you have to take it all on. It can be one little step at a time. Today doesn't have to be the day that you put in 12 hours and make it impossible. Make it doable for yourself by putting yourself into the, into the mindset to say one step today. What one thing can I do today to make myself closer to my goal than I was yesterday? It doesn't have to be a hundred hours of work commitment right up front, one step at a time. There it is. Lindsay, how can the people get more Lindsay in their life? How can they follow you? Oh, find me on Instagram. That's the best place. I'm hilarious on Instagram. So find me on Instagram, my Instagram stories, <laughs> uh, get some behind the scenes, uh, for me there. I'm at Lindsay Teague, which is T E A G U E like league with a T Lindsay Teague with an A L I N D S A Y T E A G U E find me on Instagram. And then from there you can find my website. I'm all over the place. If you're if you can't find me, you're just not looking. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Google, Google will say Google what up. up. All right. We appreciate you till next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Len Jones party of two. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review and subscribe to stay up to date on our new episodes. And remember, hope is not a strategy. Keep making moves till next time. Peace.